Good evening and uh, welcome to... Uh, oh, hang on, I'm having trouble reading that. <laughs> Love, <laughs> you get the car keys. <laughs> Ian, how's your week been? Fine, thank you. I've been just trying not to be too cross uh, all week, but um, uh, it's with some difficulty. Is it? Yes, my post bag is just full of very, very cross people. Um, and oddly, I agree with them entirely. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no, it's a cross week. Paul, how are you? Oh, fine. I've not been watching any of the news as I like the content of this programme to be a complete surprise to me each and every week. <laughs> <laughs> well, with Ian tonight is a journalist and broadcaster, Janet Street Porter, who has homes in North Yorkshire, Kent, London and Norfolk. Which one are you in, Janet? Well, Martin, I hate to update you, but I do no longer have a house in North Yorkshire. Right. Uh, I have a house in Norfolk, and I am in Norfolk now, yes. Typical BBC misinformation. <laughs> On Paul's team is comedian Finn Taylor, who in an interview last year described a typical Sunday as brunch, farmer's market, independent cinema. So uh, what's that now, Finn? Toast, fridge, Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, yep, just slowly going insane, staring at a wall. Well, you're looking good, that's the main thing. In the news this week, even if we have to keep living with the virus, there are reasons to be cheerful. Scientists all around the world are working on solutions. <laughs> Any university students worried that they're paying full tuition fees but won't get value for money, don't worry. You've got this graduation ceremony to look forward to. Outstanding performance in communication <laughs> 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 and during an online sermon recreating the feeding of the 5,000, there are clues as to where the Dean of Canterbury is hiding his fish. Finding the people around too many <laughs> for them to get. Is that a curiously updated version of the line, the witch and the wardrobe? <laughs> <laughs> right, let's get on with the show. Um, we start with the biggest stories of the week. Ian and Janet, take a look at this. Ah, the start of the Great North Run, uh, London to Durham, 260 miles. Oh, he's going to drive the whole way. Well, never mind, he never did like the rules much. Uh, there we go, there's the Prime Minister explaining that black is white and uh, the other Prime Minister explaining that white's black. White, obviously, <laughs> black. And there's the eye test. Ah, oh, Mr Cummings, can you see why everyone's so angry with you and think you should resign, you complete and utter fraud? <laughs> And I think the answer is no. I think he failed the <laughs> test. Is that what it says on the eye chart that he was looking at, that man? I am a complete <laughs> and utter <laughs> fraud. Yes, this is the news that Boris Johnson's senior advisor and the nation's sweetheart, Dominic Cummings, <laughs> is going nowhere for a change. After a joint scoop by the Daily Mirror and The Guardian claiming that Dominic Cummings had broken the country's strict lockdown by driving 260 miles to Durham and embarking on a further jaunt to Barnard Castle, he held a press conference. Ian, I'm, I'm sure you were convinced by that. He gave an hour and a half of utter twaddle. It's absolutely clear he did break the regulations. He found one tiny clause, which he said made an exception, but that didn't cover the journey, for example, to Barnard Castle. It was nonsense. It was absolute nonsense. And I suppose people were cross because they think he's taking us for an idiot. I mean, the eye test thing is marvellous. The idea that you're not sure whether you can drive back to London. So in order to test your eyesight, you put your four-year-old in the back of the car and drive around to see if you knock over any pedestrians or maybe smack into a bollard. And that way, you'll know your eyes aren't there. And I think his greatest irritation, he said at the beginning of it, all the press are doing is giving misinformation about my whereabouts. And that's his job. He gave the impression in pieces in The Spectator, and he got his wife to write pieces, suggesting he was in London, which he wasn't. So he's very, very cross. Um, this man has become the centre of the story. And I just... I cannot understand why he hasn't resigned. That's Boris. <laughs> May I remind Mr Hislop that he's appearing for the defence? <laughs> that was the defence. I think the baying for blood over Dominic Cummings is getting us nowhere. Well, he hasn't resigned yet. <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> the 
Cabinet Secretary, Mark Sedwell had coronavirus, Boris had it, Mark, Matt Hancock had it. In fact, the whole government had it at the same time, and we only found out about most of it afterwards. And you know why that is, Janet? Because the virus targets low-skill workers. <laughs> 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 That's a terrible argument that just because everyone else anyway, is a shower, the best... that the head of the shower shouldn't resign. I mean, we are an international <laughs> laughing stock. Uh, he's sort of ho hoisted by his own petard. I mean, he was spotted by a retired chemistry teacher uh, in some woods who, not, who took down his licence plate. But the only reason he did that was because he'd been told to stay alert. So he's been hoisted by his own policies. And people are walking around, going, ah, license plate, and writing everything down. The worst thing about it was Boris, his justification, saying he followed his instincts. So what are we supposed to do now? Just follow our instincts about everything? Like, I just thought that was absolutely sh shambolic. I heard from a friend of a friend of a friend who was a policeman who said that the day after this news broke, uh, if he heard it once, he heard it a hundred times, well, if it's good enough for Dominic Cummins to be out and about, then it's good enough for us. So that's the, that's the terrible danger of it all, is that people think, well, if he's, he can do it, then, uh, and I haven't, I've got no symptoms, so I can just go where I like. But everybody did go where they liked. If you see the pictures of everybody on the beach at Bournemouth... But, but not everybody was on the beach, were they? They were, you know, there was a percentage of people who went, but not everybody. On a sunny day, most people go to the beach and they disregard social distancing if they can get to a beach. Even when the story was first published, he seemed unwilling to answer questions, as this Channel 4 reporter found out. Do you have anything to add for people who have been self-isolating across this country who have seen that you've travelled miles across it? I think that's a no. <laughs> <laughs> or possibly a yes, who knows? <laughs> um, so let's have a look at the setting for this extraordinary press conference, what's being called the Rose Garden of Number 10 Downing Street. This looks like he's selling raffle tickets, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Maverick Genius? Uh, thank you very much, it's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise I'd be getting an award this evening, but I'd just like to say that this award isn't just for me, it's for everybody, for those people behind the scenes who, who we don't often recognise. The sounds and the lights, which have always been absolutely... Oh, had your full day, didn't I? <laughs> I? I'm fascinated by the white shirt that he wore in the Rose Garden. Call me trivial, but I've never seen him in a shirt before, and I've got a feeling that he turned up for the press conference in the same old orange T-shirt and sweatpants and someone in the, one of the back offices produced that white shirt and put it on him at the last minute because it was pristine. Either they were changing his shirt or they were leaning on the police to change their statement. I don't know, could have been either. <laughs> what do you think? Or both, or both. Uh, does his wife not drive, I wanted to know. Was the car full of petrol when he left London so he could drive all the way to Durham without stopping off to refill it? And was it full, still full, uh, when he drove all the way back? So, I mean, there are certain details that I'd like to know more about. Let alone petrol. How, do you, how does a four-year-old hold his urine in for five hours? Ah, maybe there's a connection between the two. Maybe his car runs on child's piss. All you need, Martin, <laughs> is a piece of rubber hose. That's all you need. <laughs> It's ridiculous. Next, you'll be suggesting it runs off the virus that they both had and filled the car with on the long <laughs> journey up there. Honestly, number 10 lied about this. There was a number 10 statement said, at no stage was Mr Cumming or his family spoken to by the police, and they were. They said, I mean, Grant Shapps got up on the telly and said Mr Cummings stayed put, he obeyed the rules. No, he didn't, he went off to the castle. I mean, they just lied. And we have a source at number 10. That's him. <laughs> Why is everyone so surprised that he finds himself innocent? Let's have a look. As I understand it, the most important thing here is um, that Mr Cummings and his family remained uh, locked down. Well, they, didn't, they didn't then, as I think some of these stories start to suggest, uh, move around. We agreed that we should go for a short drive to see if I could drive safely. We drove for roughly half an hour and ended up on the outskirts of Barnard Castle Town. Which was as much a surprise to me as it was to anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to the second part of our tour of Teesdale, Barnard Castle. 
Um, have you done any rambling around there, Janet? Is it a nice place? I certainly have. I'm not quite sure why they chose Barnard Castle. I mean, there are a lot of places nearer to Durham that you could have gone to to test your eyesight. They could have gone to Leyburn, a very another, another very beautiful market town. But no, they drove quite a long way to Barnard Castle. Or, seeing as they were staying in a house separate to their parents, they could have just got their parents to hold something up in the window and seeing if they could read it across this vast distance <laughs> on this organic farm that apparently produces weapons-grade bellends or whatever the... <laughs> 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 OK, let's look at how it all started. Uh, his wife fell ill, possibly with the virus. He rushed home. Then, when she was feeling better, so possibly didn't have the virus, he went back to work, possibly now infected with the virus, and by midnight they were all in Durham. Fill in the blanks for us, please, Ian. Uh, yes, I mean, he broke the regulations straight away. Um, by going back to work, um, number one. Then he broke the you've got to stay at home and isolate. The exceptional clause really doesn't apply to him. And it was in... Sorry. Yeah, come in. Um, Ian's met the right man, so everything's going well. Yeah. I'm terribly sorry. That was a, um, a package of Valium. <laughs> I think, I think it's been sent by the producers. I do apologise. <laughs> Why did he feel the necess necessity to go back to work? Is it because it's very difficult to bully people via Zoom? Doesn't he not have to be next to them? I think that's right. And as he said, he kept saying it was very important for me to be around because I had to make these decisions about vaccines. And I thought, do we not have any medical experts in Britain? Do we have a health secretary? Why is a political <laughs> aide making decisions about vaccines? He's only there to make the Prime Minister look good, a job which he's singularly failed to do. So why do we need him anywhere? So why are some people angry that he made the 260-mile journey? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't ask Ian, he'll tell you. <laughs> Ian. I haven't a clue. I mean, I, why are people so angry? I can't see it myself. If you can't see it, Ian, get in your car, drive to Canterbury Cathedral, <laughs> that'll clear it. You feel like an idiot. I mean, I'm, I'm quite cross. I obeyed various regulations about care homes and funerals and things, and I just feel bloody irritated. I should have led, you know, all the old people in a conga around the town and had a barbecue and got pissed. It's, uh, <laughs> it, just, it just makes everyone very cross. Ian, if you're ever tempted to have a barbecue, Get pissed and do the conga. Do let me know, please. <laughs> I'll bring my own sausages. Nobody could understand the regulations anyway before. I thought stay home was quite clear. No, we've moved on from stay at home now. We're stay alert. But I thought his explanation was about as logical as Boris's non-explanation for why he visited the pole dancing woman when he was <laughs> mayor of London. Boris Johnson needed to go to her apartment with its pole dancing pole for business <laughs> meetings or was at lunchtime. Are you suggesting that the pole dance was helping Boris with his eyesight? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> now, I know there's a lot of people paying for Cummings' blood, but let's be honest, who hasn't decided to test their eyesight? Well, you should test yours, Martin, the way you're reading this auto cue. <laughs> Shut your face. <laughs> Quick, run out and find yourself a four-year-old, put him in the back of the car and go for a test drive. <laughs> Before it's too late. Uh, Michael Gove was asked to defend this novel approach to optical health care by Nick Ferrari on LBC. Would you go on a 60-mile round trip to test your eyesight? Um, uh, I have, on occasions in the past, um, driven with um, uh, my wife in order to make sure that... Uh, uh, what's the right way of putting it? I'm uh, staggered. I don't know how you're going to get out of this one, but it's going to be fun. No. <laughs> Um, I, I think uh, people who know me would know that um, I, I'm not an authority on driving. Well, can I just ask a question here? What does LBC stand for? Is it, look, bullshit's coming? <laughs> <laughs> he said he's not an authority on driving, but he's been across all the media clearing Cummings completely, saying he didn't disobey any of the rules. It's absolutely clear. So he clearly is an authority on absolutely everything. He's one of those experts we used to hate. On Wednesday, the Daily Star front page offered some helpful advice to its readers. Cops, don't drive if you're blind. <laughs> 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 Ian, what exactly happened during this essential yet scenic excursion to Barnard Castle? Uh, they drove around, um, then uh, he uh, seemed to think that his eyes were OK, 
um, his son <laughs> needed to go to the toilet. I know, it's just so ridiculous. They got out, uh, the son went to the toilet. Oh, they played for a bit. So it wasn't, it wasn't quite a toilet stop, it was more of a play stop. Then they got in the car again and said, right, my eyes are fine, we'll go back to London tomorrow. Not, not now, obviously, because that would make sense, but it might not fit the narrative, which has been constructed backwards from the known facts to fit them. <laughs> Well, what he didn't say was that the sun had actually been peeing into the car tank to fill it up yeah, so that they could course. get back to London. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Come on, sun, drink up the Lucas Aid. We've got another 200 miles to go. <laughs> Janet, if I was to say to you, that's Barney Castle, what would I be saying? That's Barney Castle? Mm. Got no idea. It's an old saying about how it's a load of old tosh, isn't it? It's, it's an old English term for poor excuse. Yes, it is, yes, yes. Oh, that's brilliant. It is, isn't it? I've never heard that. It's from the, the Book of English Proverbs and Proverbial Phrases of 1929. Barnard Castle was used as a slang response to someone making a ridiculous excuse for their actions. <laughs> I know you couldn't make it up, could you? <laughs> yeah. Dominic Cummings accused journalists of inaccurate reporting. Um, which article about Dominic Cummings has proved particularly confusing? Well, was it the one that Ian was referring to that was in The uh, Spectator? Is that the one? Yes, the one that Mary... Mary Wakefield wrote for The Spectator. Published on April the 24th, she wrote about her experiences of suffering from coronavirus. That evening, as I lay on the sofa, a happy thought occurred to me. If this is the virus, then my husband, who works 16-hour days as a rule, would have to come home. My husband did rush home to look after me, but 24 hours later he said, I feel weird, and collapsed. Uh, well, yes, he just inexplicably found himself in Durham. <laughs> After the uncertainty of the bug itself, we emerged from quarantine into the almost comical uncertainty of London lockdown. Emerged into, drove 260 <laughs> miles back, which is pretty much the same, pretty much the same thing in the Cummings household. <laughs> I like the idea that he worked 16 hours as a rule. Then did he break the rule and work two, and then three, <laughs> and then maybe five, and then a hundred? Instinct. <laughs> <laughs> And who isn't happy about all the flack that Mr Cummings has been having? Well, Janet's not. Janet's livid. The leader of the House, Jacob Rees-Mogg, is disgusted that a special adviser is being uh, persecuted. Uh, but then Jacob Rees-Mogg never seems to have very much time for people who obey instructions to stay at home. That the more one's read over the weekend about the report and about the chances of people surviving, if you just ignore what you're told and leave, you are so much safer. I've also just worked out what LBC stands for in that, but I can't give you the last word, but it says, look, be spectacled. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the story that Dominic Cummings broke lockdown to test his eyesight by driving a car, an excuse that even those two Russian spies in Salisbury thought was a bit implausible. <laughs> Cummings had the virus for about 10 days. It was a scary experience. I never want to go through anything like that again said COVID-19. <laughs> As Cummings started making his statement, there was a background noise that sounded like someone was trying to put him off with a trumpet, uh, but it turned out it was just Robert Peston asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and Finn, over the past week, the government have been trying to distract us from Dominic Cummings gate. Uh, so you've got a slightly different question. As I ask, it goes from Scotch Corner to the Lake District. Can you name that road? No. <laughs> it's the A66. It is the A66. Is that where you get your kicks? While all the Dom's doings was at its height, Grant Shapps wanted everyone to get excited about the duelling on the A66. How much interest in the A66 did Grant Shapps manage to generate? Well, less than mine, I would imagine. <laughs> Not much at all from Sky News' Sovi Ridge. Grant Shapps was facing a lot of questions from her about Cummings and moaned. I had hoped to talk about the A66 dual carriageway and things I'm expert in. To which Sophie Ridge replied, I'm sure it's very disappointing not to be able to talk about the A66 as much as you'd like. <laughs> um, here's another one for you. It involved in a recent hoo-ha, it goes from Ross-on-Wye in Herefordshire to Bamber Bridge in Lancashire. Name that road. A54. Is it the A9780? It goes to Pretty Patel's house. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, but I'm sorry if you feel that's the road. Do you know, I didn't think that the morale of the country could sink much lower, but given them that this is going to be putting out on television, I think we're doing everybody a great disservice. Roads? <laughs> the fact that people are seriously trying to answer the question as well is even more depressing. <laughs>
I think it's very refreshing for the public to see a couple of people honestly trying to answer a question. I think that's <laughs> new. I'd put it out. No, it's the A49, uh, and oh. it was used by Communities Minister Robert Jenrick in April earlier this year to travel to his parents' home in Shropshire from his manor house in Herefordshire, which he technically shouldn't have done according to the lockdown travel rules, although he wasn't sacked. Uh, finally, on Name That Road, this goes from <laughs> no! Clapham in South London to a love nest in central London. Name That Road. A3. Nice! Finn! Finn's on fire. Uh, it is the A3, of course. I would have accepted the 3036, which is another route that Professor Neil Ferguson's lover could have taken from her house in Clapham to tryst with him at his home in central London. You won't be surprised to learn that there's a website for fans of the A3 to chat shit to each other about. There's a list of 13 things you only know if you drive on the A3. <laughs> Here's a question for you. What, according to 13 things, is the question on everyone's lips? Why are we being subjected to this on television? <laughs> <laughs> what have we done wrong? Why does it get narrower when you drive through Guildford? Mine doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Time now for the odd one out round. Me! Hey. This is a buzzer round, so do you all have your buzzers to, to hand, Paul? I've decided to go back to basics and have him. Uh, Finn, what are, you, are, you, are you having a crisis there, or is that your buzzer? No, it's a, it's a nose flute. I'm trying to work out which way up it goes. Hang on. That way up. Whoa, that's nice. I've got Jeremy the coconut. Um, and how does he buzz? Silently. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a bell. Oh, yes, let's have a look at Ian's buzzer. Nice. Your four are Pierce Brosnan, the Queen... Theresa May and Dominic Cummings. Yes, Ian? Oh, is there no one else joining in? I'm banging my coconut. Well, you get lonely on your own, don't you? <laughs> 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 this is an ABBA question, obviously. The neighbour spotted Dominic Cummings dancing or possibly just playing Dancing Queen. Theresa May did a conference dancing to Dancing Queen. Yeah, we used to think she wasn't very good as a Prime Minister. <laughs> We knew nothing. <laughs> Pierce Brosnan, he was in an ABBA film, wasn't he? Yes, he was, Mamma Mia. And the Queen, no, she was originally in ABBA. <laughs> they all love dancing to ABBA's Dancing Queen, uh, except Pierce Brosnan, uh, who doesn't like singing or dancing to ABBA. He was in both Mamma Mia and Mamma Mia 2, and ahead of the second film, Brosnan said that he was relieved to have less musical numbers. Um, what did reviewers compare Pierce's singing to in the first film? Was it a tortuous explanation of why you'd driven to Durham and back? <laughs> One reviewer said his singing was like a wounded raccoon. Uh, another described it as the sound of a buffalo being punched in the gonads. <laughs> <laughs> you know that sound. When you punch a <laughs> buffalo in the gonads, it's very important that they were tuned beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a, a look and a listen to Pierce giving it his all in this tuneful clip from the film. Whatever happened to our love, I wish I understood. It used to be so nice, it used to be so good. <laughs> no wonder she ran away. Exactly. <laughs> it's, ex it's extraordinary to see somebody, somebody talking out of key. Someone's tuning his gonads just out of shot. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you don't hear much from Theresa May these days. Do you know what she's doing on lockdown to make ends meet? All the speeches that she'd sign contracts to do, she's still getting the money from, and it's, uh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of quid. She's uh, collected 160,000 in fees for cancelled speeches. Uh, that'll get me dancing. <laughs> it was recently <laughs> revealed that the Queen is a big fan of ABBA, uh, as well as musicals, including Annie Get Your Gun which is actually what she said to her daughter last week when they thought they saw Prince Andrew coming up the drive. <laughs> Where did Dominic Cummings dance to ABBA? In his garden, his parents' garden. His parents' outhouse that he wasn't connected to his parents' house's garden. In Durham, according to the Mirror. Durham, crucially. Cummings was spotted by neighbours in the garden as he danced to Dancing Queen by ABBA. Why has Dominic Cummings' boring old blog suddenly become newsworthy? Again, I haven't really been following this story very closely, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I gather that um, various people have looked into his blog and seen that he's back annotated it. According to The Guardian, Cummings' post from March 2019 was re-edited 
at 8.55 on the 14th of April 2020 to include a reference to coronavirus, which previously had gone unmentioned. So when he said in his um, uh, speech to the uh, journalists that he'd been warning about the coronavirus a year ago, it turns out that he hadn't really which you can imagine after the rest of the speech came as a bit of a bolt from the blue. My goodness me! <laughs> Why would someone like that behave like that? So I was particularly <laughs> shocked at that point. <laughs> and it did strike me that perhaps he should resign! <laughs> so it's time now for the missing words round which this week features as its guest publication glass news the newsletter of the association for the history of glass you can get it online as long as you use windows <laughs> <laughs> and we start with man in surrey who mutters to himself while what becomes big internet hit yes man in surrey who mutters to himself while blowing glass Becomes big internet hit, and I should point out that's not Philip Glass, the American composer. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is doing Sudoku. <laughs> this is Simon Anthony from Surrey. He's Japanese chauffeur. Whose Sudoku <laughs> video has become a viral hit. Next. What will screech like a bad violinist if threatened? Nigel Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> it's lobsters. And finally, people who what while what are becoming an increasing problem in the countryside. People who drive while suffering from hazy eyesight <laughs> are becoming an increasing problem in the countryside. You're obsessed, Paul. Move on. Yeah, move on. <laughs> Calm down. I can't for move God's on. Sake. I have to stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> People who litter while dogging. People who blow glass while he's trying to compose his fifth symphony. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is people who text whilst riding their horse. This week, police in rural areas around the country have reported an increase in the number of incidents arising from people using their mobile phones while riding their horse. And that's not going to get any better when 5GG comes in. <laughs> so the final scores are Ian and Janet have five and Paul and Finn have six. Oh! Hey. No! But before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. I know how to pack a parachute, you said. <laughs> <laughs> and I leave you with news that Prince William begins to worry that his grandparents' hearing is beginning to deteriorate as he tries out the new doorbell at Sandringham. <laughs> <laughs> in London, as Dominic Cummings' speech goes out on TV, one man desperately tries to explain that it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> <laughs> and in Thailand, on her first night out since the lockdown was relaxed, one woman thinks her Tinder date could have been more honest with his photos. <laughs> <laughs> she won't get pregnant anyway. <laughs> Good night. Romesh is taking a look at modern Britain with a little help from his pals in the Ranga Nation, streaming now on iPlayer. But coming up, we're hitting the road with John Cayley and the little red car. And this time, they've got company. Peter Case Carshare is here next.